let's take a look at federalism. Federalism is a widely recognized feature of American government. Federalism is a constitutional division of government power between a central or national government and regional government units like states. The federal system consists of a national government and state governments existing independently of each other in the same territory while commanding the loyalties of the same individuals as citizens of both state and nation. Under the Constitution, the powers of all governments are drawn from the same fundamental source, the sovereign people, and are exercised concurrently. States, in turn, are composed of numerous sub-jurisdictions, such as cities, counties, municipalities, townships, and special districts, which are dependent entities chartered by the state. The original rationale for establishing a federal system in the United States was to prevent the concentration and misuse of power by a strong national government. The states were viewed as protectors of individual liberties against the national government, and many are again coming to view the states in that light. The nature and operation of federalism have been the subject of controversy since the founding of the Republic. Since the New Deal in the 1930s, many Americans, including public officials of both major political parties, have expressed concern about the wide-ranging authority of the national government. These concerns focus on the expression of the authority that has affected state and local government powers. In turn, the state's relationships with their respective local governments have increased in importance. The administration of national government programs requires accommodation to the prerogatives and preferences of states and localities that have their own decision-making structure and political majorities. Intergovernmental relations, known as IGR, are the activities and interactions occurring among government units of all types within the U.S. federal system. Unfunded mandates are federal or state regulations that impose requirements on other governments, often involving expenditures by affected governments, without providing funds for implementation. There are two important points to understand about the key terms in this discussion, mainly federal and federalism. First, federal technically describes the formal relationships among different levels of government and various qualities of these relationships. Second, federalism has been used to refer to one variety of federal practice, which main emphasis on states and state authority by implication at the expense of the national government's authority. When we use the term federalism, we'll be referring to the fundamental distributions of power between national and state governments. The most elementary definition of federalism suggests that it's a constitutional division of government power between a central or national government and a set of regional units, like American states or Canadian provinces. Under a federal arrangement, both the national and regional governments have the same independent and some shared powers over their citizens. Neither government owes its legal existence to the other as local governments in the United States do to the states. This definition clearly implies that the regional governments have substantial independence from the national government, but that both may exercise powers of government directly over their citizens. It creates some questions about how authority is to be exercised simultaneously by different units of government sharing jurisdiction over the same territory or citizenry. Federalism is also an explicitly political arrangement. This relates in important ways to how power in a government system is distributed, structured, and exercised. A federal arrangement is designed to restrain centralized power through multiple centers where decisions are made in widely scattered geographic regions. A system with separate, legitimate, and authoritative government units operating within the same territory makes it less likely that a central government could achieve an excessive concentration of power. 
Finally, federalism has an increasingly important fiscal and administrative dimension. The operations of government programs have an impact on at least one other level of government. There's also a growing complexity and interdependency of programs created, funded, and managed by different governments. Intergovernmental relations is a relatively new term used regularly only in the past 60 years. It designates an important body of activities or interactions occurring between governmental units of all types and levels within the federal system. These include national, state, and interstate relations, as well as national, local, state, local, interlocal, and national, state, local relations. The consequences of IGR are often unpredictable and decision making is hidden from public view. A second feature of IGR is that the individual actions and attitudes of elected and appointed officials determine what kinds of relations exist between units of government. Third, IGR does not refer only to occasional interactions, single contacts, or formal agreements. Another key feature of IGR is the involvement of public and private, government and non-government officials at all levels. As appointed administrators at all levels of government have assumed greater responsibility and as IGR has become more pervasive, intergovernmental administrative relations have taken an even greater significance. Many public purposes are also accomplished through non-governmental institutions and organizations. Action in the federal system is often taken on selected parts of a general problem rather than on a total problem area. Decisions are fragmented rather than comprehensive. Governments usually act in response to relatively specific pressures for narrow objectives and find it difficult to politically unprofitable to do otherwise. Although government policies exist in areas such as water quality and air pollution control, no single policy governs the nation's approach to environmental quality. A major reason for this is the availability of literally hundreds of government agencies at all levels to act independently of one another. Because a wide spectrum of political opinions and issue preferences are reflected in national government activities, it's inaccurate to speak of what the national government desires, intends to do, or is actually doing. When different governments do try to integrate their efforts through cooperative activity, their joint undertakings can be based on the foundation of programs that are not consistent in intent, design, or execution. Thus, IGR involves virtually all governments and public officials. It's highly informal and very dependent on human interactions, and it involves the nonprofit and private sectors as well. Historically, the evolution of federalism and the emergence of IGR have been accompanied by continual disagreements and tensions over just how national and state governments were to relate to one another. Under the dual federalism approach, symbolized by a layer cake analogy, the functions of national and state governments are separate and distinct from each other. On the other hand, under the cooperative federalism approach, symbolized by a marble cake analogy, the functions of national and state governments are intertwined and exhibit patterns of cooperation and mutual support. Disagreement exists among about the extent to which each of these models has existed in our history and which one is preferred over the other. The role of the courts, especially the U.S. Supreme Court, in shaping federalism has been significant throughout much of our history. Both national and state judiciaries have been called upon to resolve federalism-related disputes. Some have even suggested that the Supreme Court has been engaged in so-called federalism revolution, in which a central goal has been to more firmly fix the boundaries of national versus state authority. As part of that effort, the court frequently has acted to restrict statutory claims against state and local governments. Not all Supreme Court decisions have invalidated or narrowed national government authority. In addition, this decision is an example of the growing phenomenon known as preemptions, legal actions by federal courts or agencies to preclude enforcement of a state or local law or regulation. 
eminent domain, is the power of government to take private property for a legitimate public purpose without the owner's consent. Governments are required to pay an owner a fair price. Three trends are worth noting regarding recent Supreme Court federalism-related decisions. First, the court did not invalidate any congressional statutes on federalism grounds after 2002. Under Chief Justice Roberts, the court has allowed the Rehnquist Court's decisions in this area to stand with virtually no change. However, the court did not overturn a single judicial precedent that supported the basic elements of either the Franklin Roosevelt New Deal of the 1930s and 1940s or Lyndon Johnson's Great Society of 1965 through 1969. The courts have been highly influential in shaping the organization and operation of the federal system. This expansion is testimony to the increased complexity within American federalism. With little fanfare, intergovernmental aid and joint efforts steadily became more important components of public policy making. In the last five decades, the structure of IGR has been transformed by a number of factors by the rapid proliferation of financial transactions among different levels of government, by the development of new and often permanent linkages among program administrators at all levels, by the establishment of new forms of government at what is called the substate regional level, such as local level special districts, and by the issuance of literally thousands of rules, guidelines and regulations, collectively known as mandates, and often accompanying fiscal aid packages to hundreds of governmental units. This expansion of the national government's power has sparked political controversy of various kinds, resulting from complexity associated with increasing numbers of federal grants and their accompanying regulation. Despite the best efforts of state and local elected officials to keep pace with the rapidly changing rules of the game, there's growing concern that the national government may have acquired excessive influence over state and local decisions. Many citizens apparently believe that these same complexities have weakened the people's control over many of the activities and decisions of the government and affect their daily lives either directly or indirectly. It is also true that we rely heavily on state and local governments to implement domestic policies, including those established by the national government. In recent years, IGR has been affected by the growing service delivery roles of nonprofit community organizations and various for-profit organizations in the private sector. Several principles, themes stand out. One is the importance of government purposes organized by function. Functional alliances have tended to dominate contemporary IGR and, as a result, have become centers of ongoing controversy. A similar theme is the growing political and managerial struggle between elected public officials and administrative or functional specialists for control of major IGR program directions. A third broader theme focuses on the tensions between forces promoting greater centralization in the general government system and those favoring decentralization. Nowhere is this issue more critical than in relation to federalism and IGR, since a prime purpose of federalism is to prevent excessive centralization of government authority. Calls for downsizing, decentralization, and deregulation have been gaining ground in the past 30 years. Let's take a look at intergovernmental fiscal relations. Intergovernmental fiscal relations, also referred to as fiscal federalism, have been central to contemporary IGR for some time. Fiscal federalism describes the complexity of financial transactions, transfers of funds, and accompanying rules and regulations that increasingly centralizes national state, national local, and state local relations. Traditionally, many state and local governments have had weaker economic bases and less productive systems of taxation than the national government. There are two basic reasons for the revenue raising disparity among different governmental levels. First, local and state governments have been limited to geographic areas, 
often dependent on one or two products or services from which to extract revenues, for instance, tourism in Florida or coal in West Virginia. Second, different types of taxes yield different amounts of revenue from the same income bases. Grants and aid are money payments furnished by a higher to a lower level government to be used for specified purposes and subject to conditions spelled out in law or administrative regulation. It's been suggested that national funds assist states and localities with programs and projects that benefit citizens outside the borders of the recipient government. Administrative discretion in distributing funds is the smallest under formula grants, which are created by legislation and clearly specify the criteria for determining eligibility to receive funds. Administrative discretion is much greater in the case of project grants. With these, agencies officials have wide latitude in deciding which states or local governments will receive funding and how much each will get. Formula and project grants are subtypes of categorical grants, which most commonly are used in kinds of national government assistance programs to state and local governments. Today, states receive more than two-thirds of all formula grants and act as conduits for the majority of project grants to local government. As Congress deliberated over expansion of successive aid programs, their main concern was ensuring that the national purposes of the programs were not lost by dividing up administrative responsibility among fragmented state agencies. One way to prevent this would have been to appropriate state agencies designated to receive given grant funds and to administer program activities under congressional authorization. One response from the national level was the single state agency requirement. Only one agency is designated to administer any individual grant and to establish direct relationships with its counterpart in the national grant. The development of intergovernmental administrative ties give raise to the new label for the federal system. The proliferation of grants and overlapping nature of them soon led to a growing concern about management of grants and the impacts they were having on recipient governments. These criticisms suggest several dimensions of politics of grants. One is the provision of essential public services and equality or inequality among jurisdictions in the levels of those services. A third dimension is the procedural pitfalls that can hamper applicant governments in their efforts to obtain grant assistance. Underlying all such concerns is a common theme, considerable conflict between elected state and local officials and the specialists of their own bureaucracies, as well as those in the national government's administrative agencies. The problems of coordination have been compounded at the recipient end of the aid pipeline by growing intergovernmental administrative linkages in horizontal as well as vertical dimensions. Likewise, there's been an increase of the phenomenon of substate regionalism. The picket fence analogy is evident because national, state, and local administrative officials all have active roles in substate regional functions. By the 1960s, pressures were mounting for changes in grant and aid systems, particularly in grants management. Although various concepts and options have been explored from time to time, few actions have been taken. The changes that followed have emphasized efforts to reduce the programmatic influence of the national government, both through fiscal and administrative reform. Increasingly, state and local elected officials sought financial assistance that would permit them greater discretion in spending decisions. GRS de-emphasized concern for national policies and standards, defined state and local majorities as the key decision makers about program spending and included greater discretion for state and local elected officials. A portion of tax revenues would be returned to states and to general purpose local governments according to a prescribed formula defined by Congress and automatically followed each year. If GRS represented a departure from the problems with categorical aid, block grants were more of a modest attempt to decategorize federal grants and devolve authority to states and localities. 
Block grants are given out for the use in a specific policy area, such as community development, public assistance, or health care, but they leave much more flexibility for the use of funds to recipient governments. In general, block grants have the following features. Recipient jurisdictions have a fairly wide discretion within the designated program area. Administration, reporting, planning, and other program features are designed to minimize grantor supervision and control. Most allocation provisions are based on a formula which is also intended to limit grantor discretion as well as to decrease fiscal uncertainty for the grantees. Eligibility provisions are fairly precise, tending to favor general local governments as opposed to special districts, and generalist officials over program specialists and matching fund requirements that are usually relatively low. The original block grant concept retained the notion that national goals were to be pursued in a program area through expenditure of allocated funds. Also, there's some evidence that a block grant strategy was used to cut spending and not only to alter the degree of program control exercised by government administrators through categorical grants. One early effort was the movement for citizen participation in administrative decision making, especially where decisions on expenditures of grant funds were concerned. By incorporating such requirements into many grant authorizations, Congress was responding to substantial pressures from previously underrepresented constituents, notably poorer urban minority groups. The assumption was that government officials had been insensitive to the needs of aid recipients in the past and that as aid categorized multiplied, it would be necessary to expand representation. Another approach to bringing the grant systems and functional specialists under better control centered on achieving better coordination among proliferating aid programs. Efforts were made to better promote communication among aid applicants, especially at the local level. In the past few years, officials at the state and local levels have become more assertive to the national government. The national government has expanded many areas of its own policy activism. Here are a few examples. In Parkland, Florida, where the motto is environmentally proud, they began in 2008 to dispense cash rebates to its 25,000 residents for being more environmentally friendly. On election day in 2010, voters in 10 California cities with a referendum on the ballot dealing with taxing marijuana sales approved a new or higher tax. According to a recent National League of Cities survey, most U.S. cities faced worsening economies and U.S. governments had to cut personnel even though the national economy was recovering. Underlying these problems is the fact that local and state economies take more time to recover from a recession than the national economy does, because demands for public assistance rise just as tax revenues fall. This is in addition to state activism in a variety of other policy areas. In recent years, for example, some state's attorneys generals pursued and won a major settlement from tobacco companies. A few governors' activities sought to import pharmaceuticals, especially from Canada, in defiance of both the Congress and the Food and Drug Administration. Over the years, many observers have described the states as laboratories of government. And plainly, these laboratories have been playing with an increasing role in the overall government scheme of things. Any attempt to forecast even the near future in IGR is a highly speculative venture, but there are already certain indications. One issue that's been addressed by both academics and politicians is the extent to which intergovernmental regulation has become part of IGR. Intergovernmental regulations, which have become far more numerous since the 1960s, have been enacted as part of national government bureaucracies' efforts to direct implementation of categorical grant assistance programs. The central challenge for reforming IGR is to reduce the number of unproductive regulations without abolishing the ser and serving the important national and sometimes state purposes. 
Cross-cutting rules apply across the board to many national aid programs. Program-based rules apply to individual programs. Two particular aspects of regulatory federalism deserve mention. One is the concern that many mandated activities are costly and that governments imposing such mandates might not have the supplying and necessary funding available. The other aspect of the mandating question is the widely shared impression that national government mandates have been the hardest to bear. This does not downplay the significance of mandating issue in general. It does, however, suggest that grouping national and state mandates together may downplay the problem. Another issue affecting IGR is the phenomenon known as de-evolution, referring to shifts of governmental authority from the national government to state governments and possibly from states to localities as well. De-evolution is a process of transferring power or functions from a higher to a lower level of government in the U.S. federal system. There are a number of benefits including more efficient provision of public service, increased competition and innovation in the public sector, greater responsiveness to citizen preferences, and more transparent accountability in policy making. In the late 1990s and earliest 21st century, the federal mandates were imposed and federal intergovernmental aid expenditures rose rather than fell. The de-evolution that has occurred is often administrative. Regardless of the future of de-evolution, these and similar issues concerning the nature of federalism will likely continue to be debated. Public administration has been altered, perhaps permanently, by rapid changes in IGR. Despite recent efforts to gain greater control of their bureaucracies, most chief executives have failed to stem the growth of vertical functional bureaucratic linkages. State and local government revenues can be severely affected by economic downturns and lag behind private sector economy activity in returning to fiscal strength and stability. Adding to these difficulties is the fact that about one third of states suffer from a structural budget imbalance due to revenue growth that's chronically slower than increases in the costs of services they must provide. Although intergovernmental aid can bail out a city here or a suburb there, it's still not clear whether the cost imposed by inflation, tax limitation movements, and rising service needs can be met over the long term by aid. These controls raise questions about public accountability and about the ability of chief executives to coordinate spending activity. Other emerging patterns in contemporary IGR include some decline in relative predominance of fiscal and grant-related issues and a corresponding rise in the importance of intergovernmental regulatory issues. There's also growing recognition that the possibility of increased coordination among local governments may prove to be elusive in the long run in terms of providing solutions to some of the challenges faced. 